as well. So with that said, uh, let me introduce uh, Todd Kaliva. He serves as Chief Executive Officer of HCA Houston Healthcare at Clear Lake. He's been with HCA since 1997. In prior roles, uh, Todd served as Chief Executive Officer of HCA affiliated with affiliated West Houston Medical Center and East Houston Regional Medical Center and Chief Operating Officer at HCA affiliated uh, the Women's Hospital. Todd? Thanks, Bob. Thanks to everyone. Thank you all for taking time uh, out of your busy schedules to join us uh, in our uh, annual kickoff meeting for BAHEP. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been at Clear Lake now a little over four years. Clear Lake is a 532 bed hospital. We've been in the community. I think next year is our 50th year anniversary. So been in the community for uh, a long time. We employ uh, 2200, over 2,200 employees and 900 affiliated physicians. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been the most trying time uh, in, in all of our careers, especially in healthcare. And um, I, I want to uh, commend uh, all of the leaders that are on the phone who uh, are in the healthcare and, and all of our panelists who uh, we've all faced this challenge and, and keeping everybody's spirits high, uh, dealing with the challenges that we've had, the anxiety that everybody's dealing with um, has, been, uh, has been a challenge. Um, Clear Lake's grown immensely. Um, we have a very robust CV program, neuroscience program, and women's and children's. I think we delivered close to 3,500 uh, babies last year and have a level three NICU. Um, so the, the, the whole community is growing. We've seen, you know, we have 8% growth rate in this area, which is good for all of us. So there's enough patients here for all of the health systems uh, that are here. But uh, more importantly, we continue to focus our efforts uh, around fighting this disease that we've all been uh, faced with. But I'm uh, super uh, encouraged uh, with the rollout of the vaccine. And we'll probably learn a whole lot more about that from all of our counterparts today. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful that we're moving in the right direction and, and hopefully we'll be able to get back uh, a little bit of normalcy if, if we know what that word means anymore. But uh, I'm hopeful that things are gonna be very good uh, as we continue to roll it out and we move beyond uh, our employees and physicians and patients uh, and, and those high risk patients to everyone. Uh, so we'll learn more today, but uh, thank you for letting me be a part of the panel, Bob. Todd. Now let me introduce uh, Noel Cardenas. Uh, he's a senior vice president and chief executive officer of Memorial Hermann Southeast and Pearland Hospitals. Uh, Noel is a retired combat veteran, having served over 30 years in the Texas uh, National Guard in the U.S. Army and retired at the rank of uh, colonel. And uh, there's not enough time left in the day for me to tell you about all of his awards, but just trust me, there's many, many uh, awards. So uh, Noel, uh, thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to uh, to be a part of, of the group today and the panel discussion. You know, I've been uh, very fortunate to be part of uh, Memorial Hermann now for just over five years. Uh, you know, I joined the, the system back in uh, uh, August of 2015 after uh, my 20, almost 28 years in, in, mil, uh, in the Army. And, you know, I couldn't be prouder to join a, a great healthcare system. You know, obviously one of the largest nonprofit healthcare systems here in uh, Southeast Texas. Uh, you know, of course, with uh, our reputation as I was looking to transition, obviously looking to, to join a healthcare system that had, you know, a lot of the same values that I was used to for, uh, from being part of the military healthcare system uh, with regards to very much with a focus on patient safety and quality. You know, our system has over 6,700 affiliated physicians. We're now over 27,000 employees and we're providing care at over 250 uh, healthcare sites across Houston. Uh, you know, with our 17 hospitals, you know, we're, we're able to pretty much cover all of the different locations in Houston and, uh, you know, a lot of great work going on and we're doing a lot of a collaborative work amongst all our, our hospitals. Uh, most recently, and one of the things that brought me to, uh, to Southeast Houston and part of uh, the Southeast and, and Pearland uh, campuses was uh, we, we had that transition to our service line model, which, uh, you know, many of you all know Kyle Price, who was the CEO here for many, many years. He's now one of our senior vice presidents uh, over uh, half the service lines for our system. So uh, Kyle's move up obviously opened up this opportunity for me to join here at the, the campuses. So I, prior to, to coming here to Southeast, I was at, the, uh, at our Northeast campus as the chief operating officer and had a great opportunity up there to work in the, the Lake Houston community and uh, really get to know that community. And, and of course, this transition here has 
allowed me to really get to know a lot of the uh, this area of Houston, very similar in many ways to what I was used to up at the, the northeast part of Houston. But a lot of great work going on here at our campuses. Uh, southeast, of course, is a 295-bed hospital. We pretty much cover every part of healthcare uh, that we can provide to a patient aside from transplants and, and of course, any kind of uh, brain surgery. Uh, it's probably put it in the simplest of terms, but you know, got a lot of very uh, you know comprehensive programs, especially uh, our heart and vascular uh, an oncology service line that's pretty robust. Um, and you know, we do have a, a, a endoscopy and a gastric program, which is one of the top notch in the country with uh, several of our doctors. Uh, you know, so again, a lot of great things going on here at Southeast, and again, a lot of growth. Uh, we'll continue to, to look at ways to support the community. Uh, Pearland, uh, which is the other hospital, which I uh, am the, the CEO over, is, uh, of course, in Pearland, right off of 288. One of our newest hospitals to the system. It opened back in the 2016. It's a 64-bed hospital, uh, looking at opportunities there as well for the growth and support of that community. Both our hospitals have stayed extremely busy during this time, uh, during the pandemic. This is unlike anything I've ever experienced, you know, and I go back to my time in the military and my combat operations. This, this pandemic is something that is not, has not been easy on any of us. And, you know, some of that all cover uh, as part of the behavioral uh, health impacts that it's had, not only on our community, but on our workforce. And looking forward to answering that question, as well as answering any of your questions that you may have. And, and again, just uh, very, very happy to be here uh, as part of this community. I know that I've not had the opportunity to meet many of you in person because of the whole situation and dealing with this virus and having to do so many things like today, doing this event virtually as opposed to in person. But I am looking forward to that day in which uh, we can take off our masks and be amongst each other and, and be in a very safe environment and getting to know each and every one of you all personally, which is one of my top goals and, and very much in, ingraining myself in the, uh, in the community uh, it, that's, that support both of our hospitals. Well, thank you, and I, I second that. I'm looking forward to the day we can kick off those masks. Uh, now let me introduce Dr. Richard Ehlers. He's a graduate of Bryce University, uh, 1991, and the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. In 2010, he joined the staff at the University of Texas MD Anderson uh, Cancer Institute, where he now serves as the Executive Medical Director and Associate Vice President for all of MD Anderson's Houston area locations outside of the Texas Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Ehlers? Yeah, thanks, Bob, very much. I, I always appreciate the, the kind invitation to be with this panel. Um, group that I've known for many years. I've been um, a resident of the Bay Area going back now. You know, if you count time in Galveston as a medical student and resident, 30 years. But um, the last 10 of that I've spent um, practicing specifically with MD Anderson. Um, a regular day job, actually. <clears throat> I am a practice surgeon. I focus on breast cancer and melanoma. Uh, and have practiced at all of the hospitals that are represented here today. And uh, when MD Anderson came into the community a little more than 10 years ago, we really prided ourselves on, on um, integrating into part of the medical community and working with um, the outstanding healthcare systems that are um, that we have within our community. And we're happy to continue doing that. Um, we, like everyone else, have been deeply impacted by COVID, but uh, we're committed to our mission of eradicating cancer, and we're certainly not letting COVID stand in the way of that. So I'm pleased to be here with, uh, you know, friends and colleagues and uh, really uh, thrilled that people took time out to um, engage in this panel and, and looking forward to questions that we can answer for the group. Dr. Ehlers, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Stephen Foster uh, is the South Houston Market President for St. Luke's Health. In this role, Foster manages three of the 12 hospitals within the Texas Division of uh, Common Spirit Health. Common Spirit Health, formerly known as Catholic Health Initiatives, uh, is the largest non-for-profit faith-based system in the United States. Steve? Yeah, good afternoon. And I'm honored to serve the Bay Area community. I've been here for the past um, four years, since 2016, but I'm a native Houstonian and I'm coming back to Houston. So uh, Patients Medical Center, if you're not familiar with us, who are 73-bed hospital, located off Bellway 8 um, in Crenshaw, so very close by. Um, we do about 4,000 admissions a year, 9,000 surgeries a year. It started off as a physician-owned hospital and then later sold to St. Luke's back in 2013. 
If I can tell you anything about Patients Medical Center, it's that we treat everyone, staff, physicians, and patients, obviously, like family. Common Spirit Health um, has about 137 hospitals across 21 states. Um, and we, we obviously serve, I think the statistic that I've heard is one in five patients across the U.S. are seen by a Common Spirit Health Hospital. Um, that's more than 150,000 employees and 25,000 physicians across the nation, um, which does make us one of the largest not-for-profit faith-based organizations in the country. So I, I will mention a little bit that over the past 10 to 11 months, I think um, like everyone here, we've, we've been dealing with this unprecedented event um, that really redefined how we behave uh, even personally, socially. It's, it's changed the way we interact with each other. And wave after wave and surge after surge, our physicians and staff have faced this virus every single day. And I'll tell you candidly, they're exhausted. Um, and, and there's little Calvary. I hope we'll get into that detail. Calvary, I mean by contract or agency staff to support additional resources. Um, but yet, I'll tell you the resilience of the staff. Uh, they come in and do what they do best every single day. And I know everybody, every administrator here can speak about the stories that lift and those that would break your heart. And our staff, they really are the true heroes on the front line. Um, so we can't uh, thank them enough for everything that they've sacrificed. As far as PMC goes, um, we're full. Uh, we have been full for weeks. Um, critical care beds are hard to come by. I think all the administrators can, can speak to that. Uh, and we, I think we all collectively are holding our breaths and hope that everyone behaved on Christmas and, and New Year's and had their protective bubbles in place so this current surge goes away, which is um, expected to peak around January 20th. Um, and at the same time, as we deal with this surge, like everyone mentioned before, as we're in the midst of vaccination, uh, PMC specifically received 900 uh, Moderna vaccines, of which we've, we've vaccinated everyone at this point that we have got vaccine for. We're anticipating um, receiving more vaccines, but obviously there's a lot of, and this is a fortunate thing, there's a lot of anxiety and pent up demand for vaccines. But I know all of us on the call are here trying to do the right thing and following the directive of Governor Abbott and following the, the vaccination plan. So. I think my my fellow colleagues will agree it's been a year for the books um, and it's important to remember that this pandemic is not over and we must remain vigilant to keep our mask on. I know we're all tired of it, um, but the same precautions apply today as they did back in March when we first learned about this and covering um, our, our mouths in public places and washing our hands frequently are still tried and true practices we need to maintain. So I'll kick it back over to you, Paul. Stephen, thank you a lot. Okay, now, now let me introduce Stephen Jones. Um, Stephen serves as the VP of Health Strategy and CEO for the UTMB Health Clear Lake Campus. Stephen comes to UTMB with nearly 25 years of experience in health system administration. As vice president over health system strategy, he has oversight for strategy development, community doctor relations, service line growth priorities, and partnerships. Stephen also oversees a stroke program, trauma program, heart failure program, and transplant program. Stephen? Bob, thank you very much for that introduction. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with everybody. As all my colleagues have said, it's, it's been an unprecedented year, a difficult year. Uh, certainly at uh, UTMB Health, I have the opportunity not only to work here in the Clear Lake market, but really across our system. So our hospital in League City, our hospital in Angleton, and of course, our academic medical center in Galveston. Uh, in addition to working with the hospitals, we have an extremely large network of clinics. Uh, and in those clinics, uh, we see over a million visits a year, uh, which makes our clinic network one of the largest clinic networks of academic medical centers uh, in the United States. And, and so as we talk a lot about the difficulties and challenges of hospitals, uh, I've had the opportunity to see firsthand the difficulties and challenges in our outpatient clinics. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, throughout the, uh, the program. Uh, in addition to that, I have the opportunity to work with our four colleges. Uh, and so as we think about taking care of people, we think about taking care of the community, we think about taking care of each other, we think about taking care of patients, employees. There's a laundry list of people that all of us 
here today think about how do we take care of them safely. Uh, students uh, are another one for UTMB Health with our four colleges. And so I've had the opportunity to work with uh, many, many talented people that are equally caring and work every day to keep students in our region safe. And, and so that's really been a, a blessing to see that in action. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, that. The last piece that I would share during the introductory comments would be really around our researchers and scientists. Uh, UTMB Health has been in the forefront of the vaccine research and development, uh, not just on the sidelines, but very directly with uh, Pfizer and Moderna. UTMB scientists were in the middle of creating the vaccine, working with them uh, th through trials over the last year. And so we have some amazing people that uh, are in our backyard that I really wanna make sure that everyone knows that right here in the Bay Area are some of the most brilliant people who uh, have done just great work, great work to enhance what's going on with the vaccine and trying to keep our, our not only our country, but, but the world a safer. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't share with folks, I couldn't be more proud of the work that the researchers or scientists that we don't talk a lot about and we don't hear a lot about, but they've done amazing, amazing work that uh, all of us will, will benefit from. So uh, Bob, again, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the program today. Thank you, Stephen. Now let, let me introduce uh, Dan Newman. He's a senior vice president and chief executive officer of the Houston Methodist Clear Lake. Mr. Newman joined the Houston Methodist in 2005 as an administrative fellow. Prior to joining Houston Methodist Clear Lake, Mr. Newman was Vice President of Systems Integration for Houston Methodist, and he also responsible for oversight of the orthopedics sports medicine service line for Houston Methodist Hospital. Dan? Yeah, good afternoon, Bob, and uh, thank you to the panel for being part of this and for those that are on the uh, on the call. Uh, it's good to get the latest on what's going on, and I'll, I'll tell you that at Houston Methodist, much like at all of our hospitals, we are in the midst of what we see as a third wave or third surge of COVID patients. Uh, unlike previous conversations, though, I feel like we're in a much better position uh, as we are in the midst of the vaccine rollout that some of, uh, of my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, at Houston Methodist, we have now vaccinated more than 41,000 uh, employees and patients. Uh, we'll begin vaccinations for patients in the Clear Lake market, uh, patients of Houston Methodist that are 75 and older, beginning Monday. Uh, we'll have uh, 700 plus slots available so that we can begin working through patients in each of our community hospitals uh, over the next couple of months as this uh, vaccine begins to hopefully uh, wind down from the third surge. Uh, we are ecstatic to be part of this community. Houston Methodist uh, came to this market in February of 2014. So we're uh, about to start our seventh year here. And over that time, we've developed a number of programs. Uh, you've seen some growth hopefully on our campus. What you may not yet know is that we're growing outside of the hospital campus. In fact, we opened up our first freestanding emergency department in Deer Park at the end of 2020, and we'll be doing the same thing in League City uh, later this year. So excited to be a part of the community. Uh, looking forward to a day where we're not talking about COVID quite so much. And again, I appreciate being a part of the panel today. Dan, thanks a lot, I really appreciate it. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is, like I said, we've selected a topic for each one of our uh, executives. And we're going to start with uh, Todd Kaliva, and his his topic today is going to be workforce shortage in the healthcare industry. Uh, the first question to Todd is, what additional things could be done to address this challenge we face? More nursing programs, educators, more education in high school, uh, undergraduate students in the healthcare. Help us get a better understanding of what we can do to help. So. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, it's a it's a question and a challenge that we're all faced with each and every day. And, you know, if you just start and look at how big of industry that we all work in healthcare, um, healthcare spending reached three point six trillion dollars last year, which is seventeen point seven percent of the GDP um, hospital spending of that makes up about a third. So if you look at how big our industry is, you start to see how important labor is. So we have people here um, that's available. If you look at uh, uh, a seven, we're projecting a 7.6% increase in Medicare enrollment annually over the next several years due to the aging baby boomer population. Um, by 2028, we're projecting a fifth of the population, 75 million people on Medicare. Um, and, and that's usually when the acuity gets higher and you start seeing more patient encounters. So the demand is, 
um, growing at an alarming rate for our industry. Um, by 2030, the WHO, the World Health Organization, projects a global shortfall of 18 million healthcare professionals. And that's a pretty scary thought when you think that's what we all do. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the challenges. Um, the average age of a nurse is 50 years old. Uh, by 2030, more than 1 million nurses uh, will be retiring. So you have some gloom and doom statistics that are in front of us unless we start uh, doing things um, uh, much more uh, proactively. Um, I, I, I think when you look at um, the shortage of nursing that we have right now, which is forcing higher nurse to patient ratios, which is leading to burnout, which is leading to exhaustion, um, it's also playing, uh, playing a part. Um, we also are seeing big time shortages over the next uh, 10 years in physician shortages. They project over 55,000 physicians short on the PCP side over the next 10 years, almost 90,000 shortages in specialty areas over the next 10 years. So um, I think some scary statistics, but when you look at um, you know, our high growth rates in the healthcare industry over the last many years, um, my personal opinion is we've done a poor job marketing our profession um, at the high school level and at the college level. I think for so many years, healthcare has been focused so much on people who just wanted to be nurses and doctors. And there's so many other areas in healthcare. People don't realize we have cooks in this hospital. We have electricians in our hospital. We have plumbers in our hospital. We have x-ray technicians. We have surgical technicians. The industry is massive and we have done a poor job marketing that to students, um, uh, eighth, ninth, 10th graders, 11th graders, so that they can start thinking, maybe I don't wanna be a doctor or a nurse, but I wanna be in healthcare and start exposing them at a much earlier age to healthcare. So um, if you look at the shortage of educators, that's another thing. We've seen more and more nursing schools coming up, but the problem is those nursing schools have such a limited number of nurses they're taking because there's a big shortage of educators. And until you adjust the comp of the nursing educators and all educators, um, you know, you're still going to have challenges because nurses can still make more money at the bedside, providing care than they can teaching. So we're going to have to do a few things differently. I think we're starting to see things get um, a little better. Um, we're going to have to work on retention um, as well because people, we still have a, a pretty high turnover rate in nursing because people, younger nurses get into the field. Uh, and, and, you, and you hand them a dose of uh, uh, COVID patients. And uh, the next thing you know, um, they're looking for a different profession. And, and I say COVID, but there's other, you know, there's challenges we face in healthcare every day. That's, it's a high stress uh, world that we live in uh, from a healthcare standpoint. So I think you're gonna have to see, and you've already seen more of our large health systems. Uh, HCA bought a nursing school, Galen Nursing School, we at Clear Lake have an affiliation with U of H. Uh, I know Memorial Herman has an affiliation with UT um, uh, and Methodist with Baylor. You know, there's different affiliations where we're bringing these students into our hospitals uh, and working closely with them so they get a lot of exposure and on the job, uh, on the job training. So that's gonna be, uh, I think that's gonna be really important. Um, I think a couple of things with addressing it and Bob, you said, what do we do? Um, we're gonna to have to advertise uh, and market our profession better. Um, public service announcements, uh, you know, how often do you see uh, 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 public service announcements on TV talking about the different areas in healthcare that people can start thinking of? And even people not just talking about students, but people in other industries that would love the idea of getting into healthcare so that they get a chance to uh, make life better for people. We just have to do a better job marketing uh, our profession. We definitely have to address the comp issues around nursing educators, uh, and then we have to invest uh, as systems, and I know we all are, uh, in our staff education and training, which will uh, lower our, our, our turnover and increase our retention rate. So um, that just kind of gives you a global picture of, of, of our healthcare shortage, um, but I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll, we'll meet the challenge. We're going to have to make some changes, no question. When you look at uh, the, the growth rate that we're expecting and what we're going to have to do to offset that with enough workforce, um, the challenge is in front of us, but um, certainly feel that we're up for it. Uh, thank you a lot.
uh, these are a lot of these topics are pretty darn challenging. And so, Noel, I think you've got a pretty tough one here. Uh, your your topic today is behavioral mental health due to the strain of COVID nineteen. Uh, first, qu your first question is: What challenges are healthcare organizations facing from a behavioral health perspective, and what is your organization doing to address these challenges and help with navigating behavioral health patients? Yeah, well, well, thanks for this question. I, you know, I, I know that uh, you know when you look at what Todd brought up about the shortage of of healthcare workers across this country. You know, first and foremost, you know, our biggest challenge in healthcare right now is dealing with this pandemic and trying to get through it, and then. You look at what Todd brought up as far as the uh, shortages in healthcare, but when you look at one area in particular, you know, behavioral health is an area that by far is is very short in uh, not only personnel that provide this care, but also the facilities. Uh, you know, there is not enough uh, behavioral health facilities in our country or even in our community here in Houston. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, you, you know, when you look at the numbers and those that are in need, it just does it'll never meet the demand. Uh, unless we do something really significant, uh, and that would be to add a whole lot of a whole lot of staff with regards to healthcare providers that specialize in behavioral health, and then also to be able to add facilities. But when you look at what our system has done, of course, we do have a freestanding behavioral health facility, which is known as PART. Uh, you mean we've also done some programs. You know, we took some uh, a program when C with CMS back in 2011, and we uh, created some psych uh, crisis response teams. Uh, and also uh, with a related network, uh, referral network. Uh, so these teams assist patients uh, and law enforcement and health and human service providers to ensure that those in a mental health crisis uh, can be triaged and evaluated by a psychiatrist within 24 hours. You know, that's the biggest challenge that you have. People just don't have access to the care. And we, we, you know, we work closely with law enforcement agencies because you know, a lot of times these patients show up in our facilities, you know, and I know that our facilities are not any different than those uh, from my peers that are on this panel. Uh, you know, we've also established a 24 hour nurse triage phone line, which is available to those with a mental health crisis, uh, which provides them with referrals. You know, when you look at behavioral health, and again, I mentioned the, the lack of uh, resources in this area, you know, what ends up happening is our emergency rooms end up being the level of where our, these patients come. And so what you'll find in our emergency rooms at any given time, many of us, and I know that I, my peers could probably uh, talk through this as well, there's many times when we're holding these patients in our emergency rooms for not hours, but days, trying to find a bed for them in our community to be able to provide them with the services that they need. You know, these patients are really troubled. They, uh, they, they really need treatment and they need the proper care. And, you know, as we look ahead, this is obviously an area that all of us in healthcare are going to have to continue to focus on uh, to be able to look at adding more resources, but it's also going to take help from above us, not only, but at the state and at the federal level to be able to provide the resources to provide, you know, to support those who are struggling with uh, mental health issues. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ehlers, uh, your topic is the challenges of treating patients with cancer during COVID. 19. Your first question is, has COVID-19 affected cancer patients differently than the general population? Yeah, thanks, Bob. It, um, the answer is yes, it, it has. And um, as we're all familiar with looking at um, FDA and CDC guidelines, we know that, um, that cancer patients specifically are at greater risk uh, for um, getting COVID and for um, suffering more severe consequences from COVID. Um, it, it really, um, as bad as COVID is and the, the um, expanse of the impact it's had on our community, um, what we know is that um, cancer has actually, it remains an even larger public health problem um, within our community and at large. There are more patients with cancer than with COVID and um, cancer remains uh, more deadly than COVID. Um, but when you superimpose the two diseases upon themselves, um, it really creates um, the potential for, um, for poor outcomes for patients. Um, what we have seen is uh, it, it can delay um, necessary treatments. And um, we know that, that it, it's a much more vulnerable population. You know, MD Anderson has um, somewhat an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, compared to the other um, health systems that you know, that are all here and that 
we really um, focus on one uh, one type of patient, and that is cancer patients, um, which is good because we don't have the the breadth of um, diseases that the other um, the other healthcare facilities treat. But by the same token, we're treating a much more vulnerable um, population, um, and really, by uh, most estimates, um, in the Anderson sort of the, the largest concentration of immunosuppressive patients in the world. And it's that suppressive effect that cancer has on the immune system that really uh, we found has created poor outcomes in cancer patients. They're more likely to die of COVID, and they're also more likely to die of their cancer, unfortunately. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Um, okay, now, I'm sorry, Dr. Ehlers, uh, Stephen Foster, sure. uh, we're going to ask you some questions about collaboration that exists between the region's healthcare institutions, support the, uh, to the healthcare providers uh, from the business community. So the first question is going to be dealing with the collaboration on the region's healthcare facilities. Um, what are the additional ways that our regional healthcare institutions could provide, could collaborate together on either during the pandemic or post pandemic? Bob, thank you for the question. Um, uh, you know, your the Bay Area Houston uh, economic members know, unfortunately, Houston is not a stranger to disasters, right? Um, we've, we've seen floods, hurricanes, and, and other events um, previous to COVID. Um, so I would say uh, we're blessed to live in a city where health systems always come together and do what's best for each other and obviously for the community. Um, and you can say that for your neighbor, um, they do the right thing. And early on in the pandemic, um, you know, examples of how we collaborated together is um, we supported each other with PPE or what's known as personal protective equipment. I think everyone knows that acronym uh, now. Um, and in fact, I was reminiscing uh, the other day um, and Dan Newman and I uh, collaborated early on on 3D uh, printing of the face shields, if you'll remember, Dan. Um, and it was just these out of the box ideas where, you know, it's not normal for um, healthcare uh, providers to have all their staff in full face shields. But yet we found a situation where there, we weren't getting the, the materials in quick enough. And so we had to think outside of the box. And um, we partnered with our, our local colleges to get their 3D printers up and, and running and, and produce these, these face shields for us. Um, so it, it's those kind of um, examples where we came together and just did the right thing for our staff and for our community. Now I'll take it a, a bit further. We, we've seen what we call in common spirit health as um, hello human kindness in Houstonians. And this is true for, for all of our health systems. Um, weekly, we would come together across the Texas Medical Center and um, and meet and discuss about you know what is our bed capacity look like what is our staffing look like how's our ICU capacity and in fact um, through the state um, and, and the panelists on on here know about CETRAX or Southeast Texas Regional Advisory Council um, helped design a very complicated state reporting spreadsheet that monitors. Um, everything from the number of staff we have on site to the number of COVID patients that are testing positive and just provided almost real time information about what's happening within each of our health systems. So these daily reporting of numbers and sharing of best practices are like PPE, again, personal protective equipment conservation, or how are we managing visitor screening? Um, these are new concepts for us. We never thought we'd have to take temperatures of people walking into the into the hospital. So we had to collaborate on on things like that. Um, so uh, while there's always an opportunity to do better in communication, I believe um, you know every system stepped up to the plate and helped all of us through the pandemic. So so hats off to all the the panelists. And and I'll add one last thing is post pandemic, I believe. You know, my opinion, we should try to maintain a quarterly forum to talk about just shared issues. And then hopefully one day we'll stop talking about COVID and start talking about other things. Um, but, but, but to what Todd mentioned, you know, staffing, um, how are we building that pipeline that we're all struggling to, to get the right staff um, to take care of the patients? Um, 
there's a plethora of topics, drug shortages, and how we're managing through that. And most of our organizations face similar challenges, and those are worth a discussion at a broader level. So that's my two cents. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, Stephen Jones, uh, your topic is COVID-19 updates, including the latest on vaccines, testing, and the increase in cases. So the first question is, please discuss UTM's involved, and UTMB's involvement in providing COVID-19 vaccine to employees, other health healthcare workers, and the community. Thank you very much. So certainly uh, the spread of COVID-19 continues at a very high rate coming after the holidays. Uh, certainly at our hospitals, we're seeing about 13% of the patients have COVID-19 in our health system. Uh, so it continues to be very challenging as, as all of the, uh, the folks have talked about everything from staffing on a daily basis to just having beds available to our outpatient clinics that are getting uh, an unbelievable amount of calls per day, trying to keep up with the call volume in the clinic setting. So th certainly the rate of COVID-19 in our area is high currently. And so all of the basics that you hear about and we've talked about before here, uh, please continue to be diligent in those areas. Uh, as it pertains to the, the vaccines, as recently as last week, we were doing 2000 a day uh, at UTMB Health. We certainly did uh, over 12,000 first doses, probably had about uh, just under 3000 folks who had completed both doses. And we have uh, over 10,000 folks that are lined up for their second dose. Uh, th there's been a lot of literature out over the last few days about how the distribution will continue moving forward. Many folks have read about the 28 state hubs, three of them here in Houston, uh, Houston Methodist being one of those three hubs that we anticipate that'll continue to evolve. Uh, we certainly have been in contact with the state and I'm hearing some pretty good things about distribution and who will be able to distribute the vaccine. So I think that's going to continue to involve UTMBs and involved in many discussions uh, in that front. Uh, but there's been great work done by Methodist, the city, the health department, the, the hubs that you're reading about. I know Dan, I'm sure, will comment on that through his comments. So you'll continue to see that evolve. You'll continue to see more vaccines become available. It, today, it's a little bit of a slow process. It'll continue that way uh, until we get a little more organized as a state. Uh, certainly in Houston, there are several million folks to vaccinate. So you can do the math on that when you hear about the daily rates. It's going to take some time into the spring and summer to vaccinate everybody. And so everyone will talk a little bit differently about what that time frame is, and everyone has a slightly different opinion of how long that might take. Uh, but I assure you, the state is, is doing a good job. I assure you, every health system on this call is doing everything they can uh, to provide the vaccines in a, a safe manner to their employees and their patients and, and the community. Uh, so it'll continue to evolve, but you should be very proud of the work being done by everybody uh, on this call. And, and I would say lastly, is that we need to continue to be diligent about this. As we get through the holiday season, it is anticipated that the end of January and into early February could be another peak, depending on how we all did, as Stephen said earlier, how, how we all did during the holidays. Uh, and so uh, you just need to be careful. You need to continue to be careful. So we have the vaccine and that's a great, great thing. Uh, but we need to continue to wear our masks. We need to continue to social distance and do all the things that I know we're tired of hearing about. Uh, but based on the current rates, we all need to be careful. So those would be my comments, Bob. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks a bunch. Okay, Dan, um, telemedicine during COVID-19 and beyond is, is your topic. First question is going to be, how did telemedicine change the Houston Methodist pre and post pandemic? Yeah, thanks, uh, Bob, for the question. And I, I just wanted to comment on something Stephen uh, said a, a little earlier. Uh, you all may know on the call that you are blessed with some great healthcare providers in our community. What you may not know is the degree to which the systems work together throughout this pandemic. Uh, certainly, uh, Stephen Foster mentioned uh, some collaboration early on, which Stephen, thanks for the reminder. That was 
Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, but beyond that, uh, conversations around how we should manage visitor policies, uh, how we should treat uh, at the first surge uh, uh, patients that are here for elective procedures, and ensuring that we were all doing things in a fairly uniform manner, including sharing of PPE between systems. So again, uh, for the community, I want you to recognize not we're not just blessed with good providers, uh, we're also blessed with systems that have really uh, pulled together in a, in a very difficult time. Uh, as it relates to uh, virtual medicine, uh, telehealth, uh, just some interesting comments about that at Houston Methodist. Uh, we had, as most of our systems or all of our systems have prior to COVID, we had a platform that allowed our physicians to FaceTime uh, with patients. Uh, we'll call that a virtual visit. Those virtual visits accounted for about 3% of all physician-patient interactions a year ago prior to COVID. Post-COVID, so if we go back to April of 2020, that accounted for about 75% of all visits. Uh, three out of four visits were done virtually, 25% uh, in person. What's interesting is now that we are well, back in a surge at the moment, but, but past April into the summer and to the fall, uh, virtual visits accounted for about 15 to 20% of all of our uh, healthcare visits between our physicians and their patients. Question would be is where does that go from here? I certainly think that that's gonna be with us for a while. It was clearly a convenience for patients uh, and beyond a convenience, it was important for those that might be more vulnerable to both interface with their physician, but not be out in the community. Uh, so it served, certainly served a purpose, but beyond that, it was an efficiency for physicians. The ability to see more patients more quickly uh, certainly was a convenience for the doctor and for the patient. Uh, things that will determine how long that lasts and to what degree patients uh, rely on that going forward will be dependent on a variety of factors, one of which is what payers reimburse for virtual visits. Uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, we were seeing payers reimburse a virtual visit at the same rate as an in-person visit, and that may change. In fact, some payers are beginning to modulate their position on that. Uh, I, I certainly think it's here to stay. Uh, last comment on virtual visits. Uh, there's occasions where uh, that convenience is really important. Uh, the ability for patients and, and, and their doctors to interface virtually works. And then there's occasions where there's no substitute for a doctor laying eyes on their patient. So uh, I think that will always have a role there for in-person visits, but certainly the telehealth, televisit, virtual visit platform uh, is important and will continue to be so. Very interesting, appreciate that. Okay, so we're gonna start back up the top with, uh, with Todd. Todd, your second question is, can you elaborate on these freestanding emergency rooms and urgent care centers that are popping up all over the city? Will this help healthcare and access? Yeah, Bob, I, I, I'll tell you, um, I think the freestanding EDs and the urgent care centers uh, are gonna play a really important role, uh, especially now post pandemic. Um, I couldn't imagine um, us getting through this if everybody was totally dependent on our EDs right now with what we're seeing this last year. Um, I know I probably questioned them popping up on every street corner like everyone else. Um, and I think there's a role. Um, I think there's a, 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 we just, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the great shortage of healthcare uh, workers we're gonna see. Um, now you see uh, more access to care, which is what we're gonna need. Um, I think there's going to be a great, uh, a great opportunity and a great need for them. I think people being able to access physician care, uh, medical care on a weekend, Friday night, Saturday or Sunday uh, through the urgent care market and not have to wait till their doctor's office opens, which may allow them to get on an antibiotic earlier uh, and not have to wait till Monday where they can't wait any longer and they end up in one of our emergency rooms and then into the ICU where they could have avoided a whole hospital stay. Um, so I think there's going to be a really important uh, need uh, from an access standpoint, from a cost standpoint, uh, where you don't have to go into an emergency room uh, if you can go to the urgent care setting. So it's appropriate of care. But then I really believe uh, and I'm hopeful that they're going to play a key role uh, in the vaccine distribution um, as well. We've seen the testing process uh, and they played a very important role in, in COVID testing. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that they're gonna also play a role as the state starts rolling out more and more vaccines that will utilize um, a lot of these, uh, these clinics uh, and freestanding EDs so that the public uh, uh, can go uh, get their vaccines there. So um, I think they're gonna play an important role uh, in healthcare as we move forward. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Todd. Okay, Noel, back to the be, uh, behavioral and mental health uh, issues. Your second question is, what new challenges has COVID-19 presented from a patient perspective and from a healthcare, healthcare worker perspective, workforce perspective? Yeah, so when you look, you know, early on and when we when this pandemic first hit, you know, we, we looked at the stress that was being placed on our workforce, especially our frontline, you know, uh, clinical staff. And you look at their risk of exposure early on. I mean, that, that we had we had several that were exposed, many that got sick and, you know, the stresses that that placed on them, you know, but then when you also look at your workforce, you know, you, you look at how long we've been dealing with this. So early on, as we were dealing with this, there was the unknown, there was the exposure. And then now it's, you know, 10 months later, it's how exhausted our staff is. You know, one of uh, my colleagues earlier was mentioning about how it has been exhausting to our staff and how, you know, they've had to react to that. But I'll tell you, uh, you know, our staff's been very resilient. We've done a lot of things to try and help them get through this. But when you look at, you know, you look at our workforce, there's not only just what's going on at work, you have to look at what's been impacting them personally. And, you know, our staff is not like, it, it's not any different than anybody else living in this community and how this uh, pandemic's affected them. You know, they've got kids, so they've had to deal with, you know, kids being at home and having to, to be educated at, in their homes via distance learning. Uh, you've got spouses that have lost their jobs and the impact on our workforce and how they've had to be, you know, in some cases they become the primary breadwinner or the only breadwinner in a home. And so we've done a lot of things to help support them through that. Uh, but, you know, there's, you know, and also with regards to pay and, you know, different options that we've had to look at to help to support them through that. You know, when you look at some of the positives that, you know, have, that there have been some out of, you know, how this, you know, the, the response to COVID, you know, you look at some of the the waivers that we've gotten uh, from regulations impacting our workforce, our facilities and, and payment methods. And, you know, you just looked earlier in, in what Dan was talking about with the telehealth programs. And now you have those options uh, for patients, whereas before you didn't have that, you know, the question is, how does that, you know, going forward, are we going to continue to have that, you know, so as, as the federal and the state, especially as, you know, Texas, as you look at it, they were getting ready to go into their legislative sessions. And, you know, it's going to be important that many of these critical waivers that we've gotten, you know, uh, through because of COVID, that they become permanent to be able to support us um, uh, going forward. But, you know, you also look at other challenges that we face, you know, from uh, a patient perspective. You know, you look at, uh, you know, Memorial Harmon is the, uh, uh, provides the greatest care of, to uninsured and, and our Medicaid population in the market. You know, you look at, when you look at our community, you're looking at 20%. Of, of our population being uninsured. And then on top of that, you've got growth going on in Texas when you've got, um, you know, a thousand people moving into Texas every day. And, you know, when you look at 20% of them being uninsured, that's another 200 each day. So, you know, th those are some challenges that are going on uh, going forward and things that we're gonna have to, um, you know, that we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, you know, there's also the reimbursement uh, for Medicaid. You know, we get 52 cents for the dollar on care that's provided. So, you know, that's something that we have to deal with as, as, as healthcare systems. But, you know, when you look at everything that's gone on, you know, you look at a very resilient workforce, you look at, we've made adjustments to be able to meet the challenges for our patients. And, you know, we just got to continue to focus on those areas and continue to look at uh, taking care of both our patients and our workforce. Well, thank you a bunch. Okay, uh, Dr. Ehlers, uh, again, you're dealing with the cancer patients. So uh, the sec your second question is, how has the pandemic impacted the delivery of cancer care in our community? Yeah, Bob, it's, um, it, it, as much as the impact has been on um, the patients uh, sort of differentially that, uh, that suffer from cancer and COVID, um, it really has affected our ability to deliver care overall, um, a couple of key areas really. Um, early on in the pandemic, we saw you know, partially due to just knowledge about um, the what was going to happen as a result of the virus, there was um, a near shutdown of um, what was considered "quote unquote" elective medical care. Um, you know, dating back to the spring, and that lasted into the summer um, before some of those restrictions were released. But um, the message remained pretty clear. I um, mean, whether that came from regulatory statute or just um, patient preference, what we saw is um, a um, staggering 
decrease in the amount of um, cancer preventative services that were being delivered um, and cancer detection. So the rate of colonoscopy screening, uh, mammogram screening, skin cancer screening all plummeted in the early days of the pandemic. And it was really hard to bring a lot of that back online because many patients still remain fearful of the virus. You know, even as we had a better understanding of what the impact was, we also saw the prevalence of the virus. So it's kept people away from eating what would be appropriate services, um, which has had um, a downstream effect. We're seeing cancers um, at a more advanced stage. And, you know, there I'm sure will be data forthcoming um, over time that will um, demonstrate the overall impact that this has had on cancer patients. You know, it's also had a um, really difficult, created difficulty for us in terms of delivering care because of the um, the nature of our patients. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we have the highest concentration of immunosuppressed patients in the world, and we have not instituted any special magic restrictions that haven't been used by, you know, others on the panel, but we've had to do them earlier and keep them in place longer um, than any of the other healthcare systems um, because of the, the type of patients that we treat. So, um, even the restrictions on um, visitors, uh, family members included, um, have severely constrained um, throughout this time. They relax um, as we saw a, a decrease in between the surges from the summer and um, then this fall, um, which has really created difficulties for patients. Um, you know, cancer is really a, a family disease. It doesn't just impact the individual. It impacts all of those that are close to them. And to isolate them from their families um, while the care has been um, profoundly difficult and really impacted our ability to, to do our best um, for those patients. Um, of course, it's created delays. Um, you know, patients that um, get, the va- get the virus can't continue on with their treatments, um, and um, patients that uh, m- require uh, multiple screenings just to get in um, to have access for care. So, again, it creates more delays. Um, it's unclear whether or not uh, patients that are under active treatment should be vaccinated. Patients, obviously, that have a history of cancer, increased risk for um, poor, but those that have it undergoing treatment, there really is um, a lack of safety data about whether or not the vaccine, um, they'll be eligible for the vaccine. And we've got our experts still trying to cull through and, and discern whether or not um, we, and which patients um, are eligible for the vaccine and which should waive. Um, I think the last area that it's really impacted delivery has been um, on the availability of blood transfusions. And I know this is an area that's affected the other healthcare systems here, but um, MD Anderson, believe it or not, transfuses 1% of all transfused blood in the entire United States. So one out of every 100 um, units of blood that are transfused in the United States as a whole are given at MD Anderson. And the decrease in availability of blood um, due to um, drops in donations because of the virus um, has been felt by us. Um, so it, it really has impacted our ability to deliver in, in a number of um, very profound ways. You know, most of us wouldn't think about that. That's, that's a great uh, thought. Yeah, yeah, and I would, I would just take a moment to encourage anybody on the, on the call and, um, you know, those that are within your circles at your businesses, um, within your families and social circles, I'd encourage you, if you're a blood donor, please get blood. And if, um, if you're not, please consider donating. Um, if you have had COVID, obviously, there's a benefit in terms of convalescent plasma. But whether you have or have not, um, there are people that need it within our community um, at our hospital and all the hospitals that are there. Um, and we really, we really need blood donors. Okay, good message. Thank you. Okay, uh, S- Stephen Foster, uh, we're talking about collaboration when your topic. So your second question is, the region works together and supports each other. How can our business community partners help our help our healthcare organizations today? Yeah, Bob, that that's a great question. And first off, kudos to you and Bay Area Economic Partnership uh, because I would say that forums like these provide business partners insight. Uh, into what our specific healthcare industry challenges are. So you don't know how to help and, unless you know about the issues, right? Um, and I can tell you uh, that right now, if we're going to vaccinate 70% of the community to achieve what's called the, uh, quote, herd immunity, it cannot be accomplished 
by the six organizations represented here alone. It's just the math doesn't work. Um, it's going to take business and community members alike to step up to the plate and volunteer and help in any manner they can to achieve that goal. Um, while you may need special training uh, and a license to actually vaccinate patients, uh, we've learned very quickly that it's about 80% administrative, um, along with the logistical issues of, of keeping the vaccine, and about 20% clinical, actually sticking the needle in, in the patient. In other words, uh, we can teach it. So civic, industry, religious, and many, many other volunteers are going to be needed to achieve that herd immunity. Um, and secondly, I can not understress the value of, of human kindness for everyone, uh, for all the negativity, the disease, the toxicity in our life that we've had over the past 10 to 12 months, and I'm, you know, putting the political tensions aside, putting the racial tensions aside, um, you know, we have a very real and very powerful tool against it that we call human kindness. And we believe it has the power to change not just healthcare, but the world in which we live. And that's just our philosophy of how we approach things. So it's, it's safe to say we are all tired of wearing our mask. I think every one of the panelists would, would agree with that. We are ready to go back to the day when we can actually uh, see each other smile. Um, we do not want to miss another family gathering. Um, and I know I speak for my colleagues when I say we could all do with one less Zoom call in our lives. <laughs> so, um, so it all goes a long way when we uh, perform an act of kindness towards each other. Um, we've seen businesses give back to our healthcare heroes uh, by providing uh, meals, by sending thank you notes, by lighting up their businesses in blue. Um, you can remember all these have occurred over the past 10 to 11 months. Um, and I can go on and on. Uh, and, and my point in that is don't underestimate the impact of how these seemingly small actions have huge impacts on the morale of our staff. And now I'll, I'll pause and say I'm not advocating that you go out and buy our healthcare staff meals. Um, uh, I, really, it's I'm thanking you for thanking them. Um, so business partners, thank you for being engaged for doing your part to control the sp spread of this virus. That's the most important thing you could do for us. Um, and I'm, I invite you to continue to see how you can help us achieve that 70% um, uh, of the population receiving the vaccine and ask everyone to get educated on the facts to dispel this phenomenon known as vaccine hesitancy. We see it within our, our own hospital um, and it's in the general public, but we will all be wearing these masks until we achieve that 70% herd immunity. Thank you. Stephen, those are great comments and some very good thoughts. And uh, you, you said some things that we all, I hope we all heard, okay? I know I did. Uh, Stephen Jones, your next question is, please discuss UTMB's involvement in providing COVID-19 testing to the community. Thank you, Bob, for the question. Uh, we certainly continue, uh, as others do, uh, here on the call to provide COVID-19 testing, uh, both on the outpatient side and then here at the hospital, uh, if necessary. My message around COVID testing would be one of, if you think you need to be tested and you think you need to be treated, please go get the test and please be treated. Uh, there is uh, more and more medical research that's being developed and literature written month after month that clearly shows that uh, being treated for symptoms earlier uh, is in the long run safer for patients and better for patients. Uh, and so we've had this discussion before in many settings about hospitals are very, very safe places. Uh, there are all sorts of protocols that have been put in place by all of us here on the call to assure hospitals and our clinics and our freestanding EDs and all the other places that folks have mentioned are safe for all of you. Uh, and so I would encourage folks, again, if you need a test, please get the test. Uh, if you need medical care in the hospital, in the clinics, in the freestanding EDs, these are all very safe places. And I would encourage you to do that because the literature shows the sooner you could be treated for symptoms, uh, the better it is going to be for you and your loved ones uh, as a patient. 
Uh, so please keep that in, in mind. Uh, one last comment that I would share about the vaccine. Uh, I have had the uh, vaccine as others on the call and on the panel have. Uh, I truly, I know it's safe. Uh, I know that it uh, is something I needed to do and it was something that I would encourage everyone to do because certainly there are times and people have different reasons on why they may not be comfortable taking the vaccine. Uh, and so we respect that and we understand that. But I just want to share with the group because I know there's several others who you've heard from today who have also had the vaccine. Uh, and I, I know we're comfortable in taking it and we know it's going to help us be safe and it's going to help us keep folks around us that we work with, that we love at home safe also. So that would really be my final message for uh, this question. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I, um, I read a, a, some numbers, I guess it was late last week, there's been over 7 million vaccinations and there's been something like 26 that had severe reactions. I could be off a little bit on that, but that's a, that's a very small, small percentage. So, okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, Dan Newman, uh, I think you addressed this a little bit uh, in your previous question, but if you don't mind, uh, maybe expand on it a little bit. Uh, is telemedicine something that will continue to be part of Houston Methodist strategy going forward? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, undoubtedly, it will continue to be part of what we offer patients. Uh, you know, a long ago, the idea of being accessible to patients meant uh, being able to get an appointment with a doctor quickly. Uh, that continues to be the case, but being convenient now has a new meaning. Uh, I suspect that uh, there's some silver lining with all of this COVID discussion. And one of those is uh, fast tracking some of the things that are important for patients. Uh, most notably, in, uh, I'm speaking about the telemedicine virtual visit uh, uh, platform. Uh, that's something that would likely have evolved anyway, but we really saw it fast forward here. Uh, one of the unknowns, I uh, mentioned this a little bit earlier, is how payers choose to treat virtual visits. Uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, it was um, uh, payers would reimburse at the same rate as for an in-person visit. Uh, that clearly the economics drive the uh, patient and the, and the provider to support that virtual visit. Uh, but if payers don't support payment of a virtual visit at a rate consistent with an in-person visit, well, that too would change the dynamic. Uh, we are committed to that uh, option for patients irrespective of what payers choose to do. So yeah, it'll be part of what we offer our patients for uh, forever, uh, best we can tell now. Uh, and again, how much our patients choose to take that up. Uh, we'll see how that evolves for us. That's still about one out of every four visits, one out of every five visits, something on that order uh, is a virtual visit. So, yep, I think that's going to be with us to stay. And thanks a lot. We do have uh, a few questions that have come in and uh, you got to bear with me. My eyes aren't quite as good as they used to be. So I'm going to try to read them from here. Uh, no, go the other way with me. Yeah, it was easy to read. There you go. Okay, so first question is, uh, should we need to get the COVID vaccine every year? And whoever would like to answer that, please feel free to do so. Should we? Somebody raise their hand. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm happy to, to take it. It remains unclear at this time, based upon the data submitted to the FDA, for emergency use authorization, how long the, the immunity from the vaccine lasts. So it, it's unclear, it is possible that it's something that could be required up to every year, not dissimilar from a flu shot. Um, we suspect that, it, that the immunity will be long um, so that it may not be every year, but it may not be as long as a tetanus shot or an MMR shot, for instance, that confers immunity for much longer. The short answer is, we really don't know right now that that information is um, yet to be seen. And some of that is just a function of the speed with which we've developed the vaccine. Um, we, we don't have long-term data on it, on its immunity. So it's really impossible to tell that information will be forthcoming, especially the more people that get the vaccine. And I would also just take this chance to um, echo what I think another panelist had, had um, mentioned earlier. And I think it was that the vaccine is safe and I'm sure everyone, who's listening, that um, that vaccine is safe. I myself have had it. Um, I personally know the FDA commissioner, and I can assure you that there is no amount of political pressure or anything else that would um, cause him to um, ethically uh, vouch for the safety of that vaccine and the fact and behind it. 
um, really that by itself speaks volumes to me, but I have full faith and confidence in the people that work with the FDA um, that um, they are as, as sure to the safety of that vaccine as any other uh, medication that's given anywhere in any of our hospitals. Um, and I would encourage folks to, to get it. But short answer is we don't know yet whether it'll be needed every year. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, appreciate that. I'm going to ask this next question. I don't. I don't know that we have the answer to it, but um, maybe we do. And that is, how soon can we have access to the vaccine if we are not over 65 or with pre-existing conditions? Um, again, I don't know that anybody has an answer. Maybe you can give a shot. Shot at it. Yeah, I, th I think the only thing I could say is, you know, everybody just needs to be patient. It's going to take some time. Uh, you know, there's, you know, we're having to deal with one getting it out and getting it into arms, which, you know, that's not easy given the magnitude of what that's going to take. You know, we just look at how much we've been able to give out. And, you know, I know that from with my colleagues, you know, we're, we're giving it out in our facilities, but that's not something we really are meant to, to be doing. You know, our focus is obviously providing that direct patient care and not so much in, in providing a, a vaccination program. You know, surely we could, we've been able to do internally, but when we had it, when you got the EMS, uh, you know, and the community added on top of that, it makes it pretty difficult. So, you know, I, I know the state, you know, is looking at many, many options and, you know, we're doing our part to, to help with providing a community option. You know, I know that we've got something coming up between uh, tomorrow through the weekend where our goal is to try or is to vaccinate 13,000 in the community. Um, you know, but again, it's just going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of resources. And, you know, I hope that uh, very soon there's a very, you know, comprehensive plan across this country to do that. Yeah, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to just add uh, from what Noel said, I think they don't, we're going to have to take advantage of all of these other uh, ambulatory sites that we have across the city, which is great. When you look at the Walgreens, you look at Walmarts and uh, everywhere who has clinics within them, um, we're hearing that HEB got a huge, is going to get a huge allotment of, of, of vaccines as well. So I think we're well equipped in the city with all of our ambulatory sites across the city with urgent care centers and clinics and that sort of thing. I think it's just availability of the vaccines coming at, from the national level. Uh, and, and I think there's a commitment to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So, I mean, if you were asking me uh, my opinion on the timeline, I think we're going to see um, for people who are under 65 with no pre-existing conditions, I would say over the next 60 to 90 days, uh, everyone is going to have access uh, to come get a vaccine uh, if they want. And I feel really optimistic about that. I know uh, at the national level, at the state level, there's a huge commitment uh, to, to get the vaccine out. So let's just stay hopeful. Thank you. Thank you for the responses. Okay, so uh, we've, yeah. we've got an educator just, here. Just to add one more thing, I think in that we just need to continue to do the things that we've all been talking about, you know, continue to stress the masking, the social distancing. We, we and I can tell you that as we look at all, across all our hospitals, we really need the help with that uh, to keep the number of hospitalizations down because of the numbers that we're dealing with right now. So any, any help we can get from the community, we'd appreciate it to, to continue to push that and to ensure the safety and, and health of everybody around us. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a question here. It's, uh, the question's long, uh, and it's about uh, the educator uh, sector. So bear with me, because uh, again, my eyes aren't quite, quite what they used to be. Okay, so the question is, in the education sector, we are limited on the opportunity to work on live patients. We cannot send students to clinical sites like we normally would. Instead, we are doing a lot of simulations. Are the facilities ready to flex their onboarding process to respond to this new model. Will onboarding be longer or be able to accommodate the lack of traditional in-person clinical practice? There's three questions there. So anybody want to take a shot at that one? This is Stephen. I would, uh, from an UTMB standpoint, I would simply say that uh, we certainly are working with a variety of educational institutions on how we rethink education in our facilities. Earlier, I commented that we have four colleges ourselves. And so we've got a lot of folks who are thinking about this differently as we move forward. 
so I think you will see some changes moving forward in how we educate and teach students in hospitals. So not a lot of specifics for today, but I know that there are talented people who are working on that uh, because over the last nine months, we've needed to continue to educate the students that go to the colleges that we have. And so we've had to do things differently. So you will see some things continue to be different that'll go back to the old way. But I do think there are some good learning points of things that will continue to advance moving forward. I, I think too, to add to what Steven said, the, the big message that I would have is that we're just gonna all have to stay flexible I mean, we've gotten a curveball thrown at us that I don't think any of us have ever seen anything like this. So um, students aren't getting educated the same way. We're having to do more remote learning. We've been asked to, uh, a, a lot of us have quit bringing students into our buildings when we're on total lockdown just for the safety of our patients and safety of our staff. So a lot of people aren't getting um, their curriculum met the same way where they get their on-site uh, um, uh, uh, rounding uh, here on uh, at the hospital. So um, it's just, uh, I think we're trying to uh, do it all, bringing back students and, and our educational curriculums back as safe as we possibly can, but no question it's gonna, it's gonna delay uh, some of that. And, and the online learning uh, from hands-on is probably not the same, but we're just gonna have to stay flexible because the first and foremost thing is to keep everyone safe. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got another question here. Uh, when do we expect a company to come out with a COVID-19 vaccine that is a single dose? Do any other countries have one that is a single dose? Um, I, I'm not aware of any specific countries that have one that's a single dose. I would say that um, I think I believe that there is at least one that's um, under development, but there, there's not enough data yet for them to obtain obtained FDA um, emergency youth authorization. So um, it, it's possible one will come out. If it's been developed in another country, that does not necessarily mean that that's um, considered by the FDA for as safe to give in the United States. Um, and there are some differentials in our standards versus those of other countries. So um, just because it's available in another country doesn't mean it's here. Um, and or we really need to entrust the experts that, that work at the FDA that specialize in this, um, you know, to do their work and their due diligence on behalf of the American people. Um, I, I do think at some point we will, but I, I can't tell you when that will be. Okay. Dr. Eilers, thank you. Any other comments on that one? Yeah, the, the only thing I've heard is I think it's the Johnson & Johnson that they're, they're saying potentially might be a single dose. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they're, they're still waiting for the, the outcome of their studies before they, they say it's going to be a single dose. Okay, good information. Thank you. Okay, so we got a question here. It says, any updates on the new COVID super strain? And do you expect this to impact the peak projections you mentioned earlier, later this month? Or is it this included in the projections? Certainly in the projections that we're looking at, uh, this would be included. I, I will say that uh, UTMB researchers were involved in a study with Pfizer, uh, and we did a press release a few days ago that uh, we believe that the vaccine will work equally effective with this new strain. So there's certainly some other research that's still ongoing, but we did uh, do a joint press release with Pfizer four or five days ago outlining that. Okay, so we have another question here. Um, Dr. You all, this is Dr. Ehlers specifically, uh, you all mentioned training regular people to give vaccines. Will this training be given to part-time volunteers or are you looking for new full-time employees to fill this need? So I, I'll take that one, uh, Bob. And I, I, let me just change the question a little bit. The training would need to be on the administrative um, end of it. You need licensure, you need certifications to do actual vaccinations, but it doesn't take much training to do registration or, um, you know, security detail or 
um, some of the logistical planning that would need it would be needed for some mass vaccination site. And that's more of what I was talking about. Um, I will tell you for us, um, we probably to do about a, you know, say 500 patients per day, we're looking at about four nurses, but you need a lot of more staff from pharmacists to registration clerks to security to make sure that you've got everything in place for that. So the training and the volunteering should happen at the administrative level to support all these processes so that the nurse or the physician can um, actually stick the needle in the patient, so to speak. So, and these would be volunteer positions. I don't, I'm not advocating for any additional uh, full-time positions. I think when these come up, just like we did on the public uh, testing locations, you had a lot of community members and business partners jumping in to say, we can do this. Um, I know there's a very popular model right now going out that was talked about by Dr. Klopman with Baylor College of Medicine that, you know, we do this all the time as part of our voting and registration process, and it should be no different than similar to that. It's part of our um, shared responsibility to keep our, our community safe. Um, so something similar to like a voting process is what I'm thinking about. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the questions that I can see on the board. There is one uh, public service announcement. How's that? And that's uh, Trey Rothy at Rothy uh, said that uh, they're having a, along with Space Center Rotary, Rotary are having a uh, blood drive with MD Anderson on February the 5th. Now, what he didn't tell us is where. I'm, does anybody know where? You may want to take, take a chance on where that location is. I don't know if they're doing it at the Rotary, Rotary event or what. Well, we'll get the information, all the information on that and get it back out to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I should know that as the MD Anderson representative. <laughs> I have to confess, I don't know. I'm sure that that is available online. Um, so I would encourage folks to um, look online at, at the MD Anderson website, mdanderson.org. Um, and that information, I'm sure, is available for February 5th. Greatly appreciate that and would encourage everybody to come out and donate blood. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, so, I think Bob uh, Trey uh, had identified that he was going to send you and Harriet the flower, flyers and that you can go ahead and route it around. Okay, good deal. Trey, like was, said, Trey, can... Trey was kind enough to get me off the hook and he added the address. It's at 1100 Hercules. Yeah, so that's local. All right, well, good. Again, I can't, I can't see all the notes on the board as I'm trying to read this stuff. So, But look, I want to thank everybody. Uh, great panel discussion. Uh, we've already got some feedback on, on all the great information that you guys have provided to us today. And I can't thank you enough again for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. And we'll call it a hectic schedule as well. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all our members for participating today. Uh, we will be, we'll be back to you soon for our uh, next membership meeting. So once again, thanks to every thanks to everybody. Hi, you guys. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. Bye bye. Appreciate it. Thank you all.